This video is gonna be kind of all over the place, but if you're a musician or even a music enthusiast, it's frankly jam-packed full of really useful information. For example, the most common question that I've gotten in 2024 by far is, what streaming service should I use if I want to support my favorite artists? Or more specifically, what streaming service pays artists the most? And I have loads of hard data to share with you on this, and the answer is, um, really unexpected. In fact, you know what? Right now, I want you to guess which music streaming service pays the most per stream, and I can almost guarantee that not one of the viewers of this video will have guessed correctly. Another pretty exciting thing in this video, I've sussed out a way to catch and identify musicians and artists who download music off of AI music generator sites, claim it as their own, and then put it on Spotify and other streaming services to siphon royalties away from, you know, actual musicians writing their own music. Then I got a little bit obsessed and took it up a notch and trained an AI model that so far has been able to detect if a song has been generated by AI on Suno with 100% accuracy. So we're going to talk about that. What else? Also, myself and Venus Theory subscribed to every major loop and sample platform, downloaded a bunch of random loops, and made a whole bunch of songs, like close to a hundred ultimately. Then I organized and ran them all through the same content ID APIs that YouTube and Spotify and Instagram use. In other words, the goal of this is to tell you which of the bunch is the most and least likely to get you copyrighted due to other artists using the same loops or samples. And the answer that we found will blow your part of your brain that processes obvious things because it's not actually that surprising. So let's, um, I guess this video is a little bit too disheveled or disorganized to have a title sequence, so. Some guys like football, some guys like motorcycles, some guys like anime. I like to generate strange sounds on AI music sites by the thousands, then upload them with an API that compares them to previously copyrighted music, and then try and isolate reliable methodology that would stand up in court should, I don't know, an artist or record label say, hey, assholes, you stole my work without asking and used it to raise hundreds of millions of venture capital dollars. How about you pay me now? But really, this is a long work in progress that I've been doing intermittently since Google's Magenta came out, and a little side quest more recently was writing a script that's scraped music other people were writing on Udio or Suno, and then seeing if I could find the AI-generated music on streaming platforms. And uh, yeah, it turns out that this is actually a pretty active and lucrative gray market. And I say gray market because most music streaming platforms have rather ambiguous terms about AI, but I would assume that a tech company like Spotify doesn't care if music was made by humans or not, but would also not be interested in paying royalties on bodies of work that aren't copyrightable. In my experiment, I exhaustively scraped 560 of Suno's top generated songs and staff picks, and out of those 560, only 11 were not being monetized by posing as a human artist on a digital streaming platform. I certainly don't want to call out a legitimate human artist who got copyright claimed. I'm going through this process to make sure that they are using Udio or Suno to upload music to Spotify. I'm doing it by ear, which is not fun. So the name of this artist is Ale Rosie song name is Blue Thoughts. So they intentionally obfuscated the name and claimed that it's their own. And what's even worse is that in the vast majority of cases, the artist and song names were changed and the musician was a verified artist on Spotify. And then of course the artist is verified. They even have their pick, their new song that you could listen to. Their discography has oof, a lot of albums, huh? Wow, look at all this shit. Jesus Christ. So this song, for example, has 688,946 plays. That's significant. So if you're wondering, this is like $2,000 earned from the royalty pool. Now, when you upload or release a new song to a digital streaming platform, you get something called an ISRC number. And while the full 2024 stats haven't been released yet, if you analyze the ISRC registration data, it looks like, as of last June, that there was already a 15% increase in new songs uploaded to streaming services per day over the previous few years. So if we are assuming that the second half of 2024 performed the same as the first half, that suggests that over 50 million new songs have been uploaded to Spotify in just the last year. And another piece of data worth considering is that music being registered from record labels is dropping and music being registered from independent musicians is rising exponentially. Independent artists representing a larger portion of released music is really good news, said the version of me in a parallel universe where AI music isn't flooding into streaming services. In the universe that you and I share, unfortunately, it's really depressing news. By the way, if you're 
curious, I quickly whipped up a few Spotify playlists of music that has been 100% generated on Suno or Udio. So as a sort of useful precursor, let's talk about MP3s for a second. The technology was quite the rage when I was in my late teens, but these days I feel like kids just don't appreciate the magic of psychoacoustic compression, you know? Let's just get this hard to digest fact out of the way first. Chances are that the vast majority of the time, you cannot tell the difference between a lower quality MP3 and a lossless uncompressed WAV file or CD. Me personally, on my finest monitors or headphones or amplifiers, cannot reliably tell the difference between a 256 kilobit per second mp3 file or a lossless file. And NPR a few years ago did a fun double blind study and four out of five people couldn't tell the difference between a 128 kilobit per second mp3 file and a lossless file with the majority of the people selecting the lowest quality file as the one that they thought was the one with the highest quality. The point is, unless you are an extremely rare exception, you usually cannot tell the difference between compressed and lossless audio. So why are we talking about this? Well, when you listen to music here on YouTube or on Spotify or something, you're listening to a heavily compressed file, usually between 7 to 1 and 10 to 1, meaning that if the lossless audio file is 50 megabytes, the size of the streamed audio file is ultimately like 5 megabytes to 8 megabytes. So when you consider that the vast majority of people don't notice the difference when up to 90% of the information is missing, the amazing psychoacoustic magic trick of audio file compression becomes fully appreciated. Ultimately, our brains are just collecting pressure waves and then passing them through latent inhibition and then only really registering data that's useful to us. And audio-visual file compression has managed to make a surgical art out of exploiting that distinctly human information processing workflow. Earlier this year it dawned on me that very little of what generative AI companies were non-consensually scraping off the internet was uncompressed or lossless. They scrape things like YouTube and Spotify and SoundCloud to make their datasets generate AI music. But a neural network of this type, even if it's a convolutional neural network, is a black box. You can't tell it to note these limitations in a functional way. Even if you could, you can't technically describe the differences you might hear in compressed files. You just say, it's glitchy sounding, or it sounds a little bit off, and that's useless information in machine learning. My point here is that 75 to 90 percent of information that humans don't realize is missing when listening to compressed audio could potentially be used as a fingerprint when identifying if something was created with generative AI, and potentially even identifying the content that was scraped in the dataset. For obvious reasons, I'm not going to get too technical about my methodology, but I've managed to find the delta, or the isolated fingerprints of music generated on Suno, and I assume that this will be possible on other services as well, but I went for the one with the $500 million valuation first. That first initial test had 100% accuracy, so I had a call with some friends that can improve and further test it who I trust to not publish or leak the information that would make circumvention easier. I would not personally consider myself a sample flipper or loop pack user for my own music, but it's safe to say that if you make music on a computer, then you're probably familiar with loops and sampling. A few years ago, Venus Theory made an excellent video about the splice problem, and you should definitely watch that video. I'm gonna link it in the description. Uh, also, the splice problem isn't solely limited to splice, by the way, that's just a side effect of market saturation. So if you use a service like Splice and you download a bunch of loops and put them together and make a song, there's a pretty strong chance that someone else has used some of those loops for their own song, and you both have the legal right and license to use it, but YouTube and Spotify and whoever else doesn't know that. As you probably know, these sites have content ID systems that prevent you from just uploading Dark Side of the Moon and claiming royalties on it, but in this case, these systems are assuming that you stole music from the other Splice user, and they'll either block you for copyright fraud or, in YouTube's case, give some or all of your royalties to the other artist. This is often viewed as this unforeseen problem that is mostly unpreventable when it's it's completely and entirely preventable. The first and most obvious choice would be for platforms like YouTube and Spotify to recognize a whitelist for particular data and not flag it at all. Another workaround would be for a company like Splice to register ownership of all of their content before making it public and then not claiming any money or attribution for it. This mechanism works nearly flawlessly. Unfortunately, if you run into this problem with loop or sample services, it will be long after you've paid the loop library and the distributor, so there's not much incentive for anybody to do much about it. But I suppose if somebody had enough time on their hands, they could subscribe to all of the major loop library services and make close to 100 songs on them and then run them through a massive content ID API and see which service has the lowest chances of landing a musician with a copyright claim headache. I wonder who would do such a thing. 
They specifically have a section so you don't trigger content ID. Yeah. If you want access to the filter for <laughs> undiscovered sounds or content or sounds that aren't as likely to trigger content ID, you do have to pay extra or you do have to get a creator or creator plus plan, not a Splice X Studio One Pro or Sounds Plus plan. So Loop Cloud just keeps crashing. It just keeps crashing. Yeah. The the standalone yeah. app. And I, I'm trying to use the bridge thing to do it in my DAW, but it, it doesn't want to talk to the bridge. Generally, all of the songs that we made were about a minute or so long, and the loops were pitched in time stretched to fit in a way that just aesthetically worked for the song, which is what I assume most people do when they're using loops. So how did they do? Let's go from best to worst and use a little bit of algebra to get us a comparable score. And the higher the score, the more likely you are to get copyright flagged for using a sample or loop on that service. I made 14 songs using loops from FL Studio Cloud, and that got 18 copyright matches with other published music, which scores us at 100. Venus Siri and I made 18 songs combined using Loop Cloud, which earned us 28 matches or copyright flags, which scores us at 155. I made 16 songs on Splice, just picking whatever I wanted for my little tune, and got 30 copyright flags. That scores us at 166. And finally, I made nine quick songs using old Akai sample CD libraries from loop companies like Zero G and Ubershawl, and that got me 29 matches, so 320. In my opinion, there is no real winner here. These are all really troubling numbers that should probably make you reconsider how you use loops. For example, if you're using a 10 second melody, perhaps use it as inspiration for your own melody or write around it and then remove it later in your session or don't, I don't care. Okay, a few more things that you might find interesting. Splice charges extra for rare finds, a tag that will provide you with a curated list of sounds still undiscovered by most users. Using those exclusively in four songs got me six copyright flags bags still pretty bad. Also interestingly, Splice has a new feature called Stacks, which uses their own BPM and Harmony tagging system to randomly combine loops to give you some um, interesting options. Anyway, I churned out 10 loops with this, mostly under 20 seconds in length, and got eight copyright pings. And I initially was surprised that this was faring better than even the rare finds were, but ultimately I think that the reason was because the songs were just much shorter. Finally, you might be wondering why I didn't include TrackLive, and that's because TrackLive operates completely differently. They're actually a holding company with investors from other holding companies that buys up or leases the licenses of music as a general investment. The website TrackLive combines those publishing holdings with music for hire to ideally make additional money on those holdings. And most of the things that you get on TrackLive requires you to register its use and in some cases split a small amount of streaming royalties. So unless there's an error of some sort, if your music is getting flagged for using TrackLive samples, it might be because you just didn't fill out your forms. But let's say that you get past the content ID and licensing nightmare and your song blows up, how much are you gonna get paid? So I own 100% of my own music. Anything that was released on a label years ago, I bought back. I own the publishing, the mechanical, everything. So these numbers that I'm about to give you are about as accurate as you could possibly get if you're looking for the pay per stream rate for independent musicians. I also ran these numbers by a few friends who also own all of their discographies, and they were very similar. All right, let's go from the bottom up. See all of these streaming platforms and stores? They either didn't even bother reporting, much less paying anything, or literally not one person listen to my music on them. All right, so let's get into the services that did pay me, and unsurprisingly, social media is at the bottom of that barrel. The Russian social media site VK is paying me $0.00005 per stream, which means that I need 200 streams to get a single penny. Snapchat comes in at $0.0001. Meta is chiming in with an abysmal $0.0003 per stream, and TikTok is a little bit higher at $0.0021. All of these are worse than every music streaming service on this list. Tied in their shame is YouTube Music and Pandora at $0.0027, and predictably near the bottom is Spotify with $0.0029. Apple Music is widening the margin a bit by paying more than double what Spotify pays at $0.0026 dollars per stream. Deezer is paying 0.007 and Tidal is still chugging along with a 0.0078. Now for the top three, all of which are very surprising to me. 
paying a whopping $0.0096 per stream is Amazon Unlimited Music. Say what you want about Amazon, but from my data, it appears that they are paying like 3.5 times more than Spotify is. Coming in at number two is Cobuzz, which is a French streaming service that I had never heard of until a few months ago. They're paying me $0.0136 per stream, crossing the penny per stream threshold, which I think is the first time I ever looked at streaming royalties and felt fairly confident. Compensated. But then again, I don't think that optimism has ever rewarded me in this industry. And I'm sure like everybody else, once they scale and have a decent market share, they'll start wringing the towels and we'll see those streaming rates go down just like they did with Spotify and everybody else. Speaking of that, here's Spotify's rates over time since I personally signed up. It dropped 10.9% from last year and over 50% in the last decade. If you adjust that for inflation, that would be a 68% drop in pay per stream. Meaning that in 2024, artists got paid less than one third of the price that they received when Spotify first came to North America 13 years ago and they agreed to put their music there. Okay, sorry, number one, the highest paying digital streaming service in the world right now is Peloton, the expensive stationary bicycle company? So you can use Spotify and other DSPs on your Peloton bike, but they also have their own Peloton Music, which is a curated and licensed catalog. So it doesn't seem to be something that you can just join, nor is it something that the vast majority of your listeners will have access to, but they are paying me a whopping three cents per stream. Or look at it this way. If every single person in the world who streamed my music made the small, tiny sacrifice of buying a $1,500 stationary bicycle and paying $40 a month to listen to music on it, I'd be making a cool $6 million per year. Okay, seriously, if you're an active watcher of my content, I feel like over the last five years, I've made a pretty solid, conclusive, well-researched case and argument for why Spotify and other big streaming services are poisonous for artists and the evolution of music. Maybe now is a good time to just open up your phone or web browser and cancel that shit. Consider signing up for something that more fairly pays the artists that you enjoy listening to before they do what I did and stop releasing anything on there due to lack of incentive. Or even better yet, see if they have something more direct and involved like Patreon. That absolutely changed the game for me and allowed me to sit around here and crunch numbers for my viewers in hopes that it would inspire some carrots and sticks to be distributed to those services and companies that deserve them. And hey, speaking of Patreon, a little bit over a year ago, I decided that I was going to go all in on this YouTube channel with my finances, with my time and my reputation. And in that time, it's been full of deep dives and risky journalism and actively untethered science education. And some of these videos have performed tremendously. And that performance definitely got the attention of companies like Netflix. And while that's extremely flattering, for the next year, I think I'm going to stay right here and keep doing what I'm doing and keep scaling the way I've been scaling. For example, the Spotify bot video or the ADHD video or the Tesla video have all resulted in other organizations or law firms taking note and pursuing ways to either combat bad things or improve the good things. This sounds cheesy and trite and you probably hear it all the time from me and you probably hear it from other YouTubers as well. But if you're one of my Patreon supporters, this is because of you. It could have not happened any other way. Do you think that BetterHelp or MyHeritage or NordVPN would sponsor a video where I'm secretly recording the CEO of an ADHD drug company? No. As I've mentioned in other videos, this channel operates under the umbrella of a nonprofit organization. And this last year or 18 months of this channel can only be done with direct viewer support. It's not only helped pay for research, but it's helped pay for media liability insurance. And I've received plenty of legal letters and threats and all of them got forwarded to a Stonewall legal team for a major insurance company. And I just wanted you to know that if you've been an active supporter of this channel, all of this is made possible by you. And I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart and my penis. And if you wanna join my Patreon, it has plenty of released and unreleased music and pro audio samples and yada yada. And more importantly than all that, it has a really healthy community that actively inspires members to keep creating music and art and feeding their passions. Thank you for watching, keep creating, bye.